Hello again and welcome to another Mordian Glory Warhammer 40k video. In today's episode, we shall be doing another after action report. That's right, it's time for some more dispatches from the front lines. And oh boy, do I have a spicy meatball for your viewing pleasure today. You see, I went to a tournament. That might be kind of obvious by the kind of video that you're watching, but this wasn't any old tournament. This wasn't a local RTT or even a GT. I traveled all the way to the Lost Colony of America to take part in the Adepticon 2024 40k champs. This was a super major tournament. There were going to be almost three hundred players battling it out for supremacy and my humble mech guard waded into an entirely new meta but how did the chimeras how did the metal boxes perform in such uncharted territory well there's only one way to find out let's mount up roll out and drive right into today's episode As a tradition, I want to start off by saying a few thank yous. Firstly, I want to say a big thank you to Adepticon for putting on the 2024 champs. It was a really good tournament. In fact, I can say that overall Adepticon, not just the events and the tournaments, but everything else that was happening was probably the best 40k, best wargaming event that I've ever been to. There was so much to do and it was just a ton of fun. I also want to say a big thank you to all of my opponents. Every single one of them was an absolute gent, a pleasure to play against. And even a few of them knew about the Morning Glory channel, so it was fantastic to put some faces to some names. And finally, I want to say a big thank you to all of the other Brits that I've traveled over with. I was in a big group of eight, which included Salty Simon, and the whole thing wouldn't have been the same without them. Lots of beers were had, lots of jokes were had, lots of victory chicken and also commiseration chicken was shared by all. And it was just an amazing event. Like I said, it just wouldn't have been anywhere near as good if I hadn't had that fantastic group of people to go with. But with all of that said, let's not mess around any further. Let's get into the main part of the video. And of course, we'll start off with the list overview. Now, as usual, I have done a separate video covering this list in the fine detail. And I'll make sure there's a link to that down in the description below. But I'll give you a brief summary of what was in the list and some of the thoughts behind the army. So I decided to take Mech Guard to Adepticon and there were a couple of reasons for this. Firstly was the more tabletop side of things, which was I think Mech Guard is really competitive. I've been having great success with it in my own tournaments and I've also been talking to a few other people that I've been trying out and they've been having good results with the mechanized guard as well. So it's a kind of play style that I really want to push and you might see me take it to a few more tournaments just to see how far I can take it and really start honing and defining and standardizing, really just working out what is the best mech guard to take. So I'm kind of on a bit of a mech guard kick at the moment. The other reason was to do with real life logistics. I needed an army that was relatively compact by guard standards and taking a hybrid guard army when I've got things like big Rogal Dawns in there and loads of different model types can take up a lot of space. And so I went with Met Guard because it's actually quite compact. I fit my entire army into two small KR multi cases, which I was able to actually just take as my hand luggage on the plane. So with those considerations, the list that I ended up taking consisted of two tank commanders. The first one had a Demarcia cannon, a heavy bolter, two plasma cannons and a heavy stubber. And the second one had the El Clasico loadout, a battle cannon, a Laz cannon and two heavy bolters and a storm bolter. Now you might be thinking, Morning Glory, why the heck are you taking storm bolters over heavy stubbers? Is this some secret meta source that you have encountered? No. Not at all. The reason that I went with the Storm Bolter is that's what it was modelled with. And Adepticon are very, very strict on WYSIWYG. They make no exceptions, no allowances. And even if I was to spend most of my games and you know out of the eyes of the judges and 
they, they may not have noticed. I don't want to go all the way to America and the first game, the judges come along and say, that says it's got a heavy stubber on your list, but it looks like a storm bolter. That's not WYSIWYG, take it off. Because they are that ruthless. They'll, they'll be like, if it's not WYSIWYG, you can't use it. So any time you see in this list, maybe a suboptimal choice, understand that it was a case of that's what it was modeled with. So that's what I'm going with. These two tank commanders gave me three orders to play with, which was not a huge amount, but was more than enough when you take into account some of the other stuff that's in the list. I had a lot of stuff that didn't really rely upon orders. For example, after the two tank commanders, I had six chimeras with six units of Kachan jungle fighters in them, and every single squad of Kachan jungle fighters had two flamers. None of these chimeras or jungle fighters need any orders they just scout moving the chimeras and the flamers well they auto hit so they don't need anything like take aim in terms of other fire support i then had two more lehman russes i had a lehman russ battle tank and i had a lehman russ exterminator now the battle tank is a, is something that i've really started to warm up to in fact i would say that the lemus battle tank with the loadout that i gave it which was a las cannon and two plasma cannons and a heavy stubber and of course under killer missile or the vehicles under killer missiles that was uh, that that's becoming my favorite lemon rust loadout it really can take on anything and the full re-rolls to hit combined with the really long range of the guns I mean that often it can stay still gets you a lot of lethal hits and really gets around some of the strength issue because strength 10 is okay but it can struggle in some of the the bigger uh, bigger threats bigger vehicles and monsters so i really so i took one lemurs battle tank with all all of the guns and then i took a lemurs exterminator because i love the exterminator it's a fantastic force multiplier and I, my exterminator had a heavy bolter and two multi melters and also had a heavy stubber on top of it as well finally we had some indirect fire and their support so we had one basilisk one manticore and two scout sentinels with las cannons and hunter killer missiles overall this meant that i had four big tanks six mechanized infantry squads two artillery pieces and two scout sentinels oh and there was also a cheeky cyclops demolition vehicle that was making up some points and was doing some secondary objectives for me the main tactics behind this list is that the chimeras are really fast with their scout move thanks to the Katachans and they can push forward be aggressive and draw fire and score primaries whilst the artillery and the tanks pound the enemy into dust and the sentinels uh, and the cyclops do some cheeky secondaries as well so that just about covers the army but there's one more thing we need to talk about before we get into the games the lay of the land how competitive was this event what was the terrain like? Fundamentally, Adepticon is a super major tournament. This means that you get a huge breadth and variety of armies and player ability. Overall, I would describe it as a competitive event, but it certainly was not a shark tank, but it wasn't just a seal clubbing bonanza either. For example, every player that I played was using their preferred faction, which they'd had plenty of practice games with. And half of the armies that I faced were slightly off meta, and the other half of the armies were very on meta. Could even be described as the typical net list for their chosen faction. Now, the format for the event was really interesting. In other Super Majors that I've been to, uh, the vast majority of players will play five games over two days. Three on the first day, two on the second day. And then the top eight, like the top players, will play for either another three games on the same day or they'll come back another day and play three games. And there's basically a bit of a knockout round in the final uh, final cut as it were but with the depth goal, what they did is they had everyone play four games on the first day which was really grueling definitely a test of endurance and stamina and then if you won all four of your games you got to play in the second day where you played another four games and that was a knockout round so it very much was a super major but there was one big day for most people rather than sort of two medium days 
at the time it was quite it was quite strenuous but looking back on it it was quite good that it was just one and done so i overall i actually quite liked the four games one day approach because that it meant that the second day when i was at adepticon i was able to spend it just a little bit tired half asleep but wandering around the event and looking at all the other cool stuff that was there because it's not just a tournament there's loads of other stuff going on as for the terrain it was GW standard. This was a huge, I'm going to say it again, a huge improvement over previous Adepticon terrains. Last time that I went, two years ago, it was player placed. Now, I personally am not a big fan of player placed, but it can be done well. Unfortunately, Adepticon's player placed terrain basically consisted of four small columns, pillars, and maybe a forest or something that was acting as a forest, and that was it. Adepticon's terrain was infamous for being quite terrible. This time was different. This time, their terrain was on point. It was pretty much all GW standard, and by that I mean not only did you have the, the Perspex bases, except for they used little neoprene uh, rectangles from like cut up battle mats which is really really good M looked much better than the the perspex but they also had all of the games workshop terrain itself so things like the sector mechanicus and the proper ruined buildings everything the terrain looked good i have to say from a purely aesthetic point of view these were the best l-shaped ruins that i have ever played on and that might sound like i'm being a bit facetious and taking the piss I'm not. Between them having the battle mats and then the, the neoprene slat, you know, the, the not perspex, but neoprene bases for the terrain that matched the battle mat, and then having fully painted GW terrain on those neoprene bases, it looked really good. Every table was actually nice to play on, and it looked the part. It wasn't a bunch of gray mdf ruins that have kind of been shoved on a battle map but aesthetics aside the terrain was mirrored and it was balanced and it was much better to play upon than your normal player place terrain i felt like it was much fairer i know that player place terrain versus fixed terrain maps is a bit of a controversial topic people do like to discuss it so i fully encourage you to do so please let me know what kind of terrain you prefer to play on down in the comment section but of course Keep it civil. I don't mind passionate yet polite discussion, but we don't want anyone uh, getting a bit rowdy down there. Small side note, this was the first time that I played intensively on GW Standard Terrain maps, both in this tournament and then also later in the team tournament at Adepticon. And it really did open my eyes to what it's like playing on that terrain. And I will be doing a separate video going through it and letting you know some of the pros and cons and some of the things to be aware of. But that just about covers it all. Semi-competitive, great players, good terrain. Adepticon Champs 2024 was shaping up from the get-go to be a fantastic tournament. But I know why you're all here. I know what you guys want. Let's now head over to the best bit, the games. So the first battle was going to be his Imperial Guard versus Da Orcs, a classic of Warhammer 40k. I was paired into Kevin and he had a slightly different Orc list to what I normally face, but still very much on brand for the faction. There were a few things in there like you would expect, such as Bad Rook and a big unit of flash kits in a truck. There were some Beast Snagger boys that were in a truck as well. And then there was a Battle Wagon. I'd say I've not faced off against a Battle Wagon in a while. It was a treat to see it on the tabletop. And inside this beast, there was a big unit of knobs with a war boss and then a unit of Orc boys. We then had Gasgore with some Mega Knobs and there were two beast bosses. One was Mozrog and one was just a beast boss on a big ass squig. And that pretty much was most of the list. There might have been one or two things that I'm missing there, but that was the majority of it. The mission was Mission L 
from the GW standard pack, which is Scorched Earth, Chilling Rain, and Dawn of War deployment. Interestingly, this was the exact mission that Salty Simon and I had done as part of our Adepticon practice game and that we filmed for the battle report. So it was quite nice going into it, knowing how the terrain was going to work and where the good firing lanes were. I definitely felt like I had a slight bit of an advantage in this game because I had not only played this mission before, but also I've played against Orcs a lot and my opponent doesn't play against Imperial Guard regularly. So I had bit of a knowledge leg up. For deployment, I put my artillery in the back left corner and then I had one of my tank commands, the one with the Marshall Cannon that was near them as well. And then I also had a couple of Chimeras. In the middle, I had uh, another couple of Chimeras and I also had my Lehman Russ battle tank. And then on the right flank, I had the tank commander with the exterminator and two more Chimeras. The plan was if I went first, I would be able to scout move forward aggressively, start taking objectives and locking them down with mech infantry because I know that the orcs are going to struggle to destroy my chimeras at range. So if they destroy them in close combat, then the infantry will pile out and the objective will still be mine in the next turn. If I go second, then I can use my scout moves to reposition a little bit and make sure that the orcs won't be able to get any cheeky turn one charges on me. As for the Orcs, their deployment consisted of the flash kits in the truck on the right hand side. This is all done from the guard perspective. And they also had a unit of Grotz holding the home objective. They then had uh, the truck with the beast snaggers that was also on the right hand side, but just on the other side of the ruins. A couple of beast bosses and Gazgull in the center. And then the battle wagon was on the flank. Should mention there was also some storm boys, but they were in reserve. Both sides picked tactical objectives and then there was only one thing to do, find out who was going to go first. And in a bizarre twist of fate, I won the roll off. I know this is happening more and more. I don't really know how to handle it. Maybe it's something about being in the American meta. Maybe there's the something in the air, something in the food. I'm not sure. But I actually went first in my first game at Adepticon, which was kind of cool. And my first turn essentially consisted of scout moving chimeras forward and locking down the left objective and also the right hand objective. I didn't want to get too ballsy in the center because I know that the orcs are going to come in there and start messing things up. However, as my objectives that I had drawn were investigate signals and engage in all fronts and I wanted to get maximum engage turn one, the two units that I did get very Billy Big Bollocks with were my scout sentinels. Both of them moved forward and scout moved and advanced as far as they could go, which allowed them to get into the uh, opposite two table quarters. So I did get max engaged. Funnily enough, I actually positioned a couple of units to do investigate signals and then forgot to do it. And I completely forgot to declare it. I was meant to get infantry squads out and do it. And I said to my opponent, look, I'm going to set the tone for the game here. I've made a mistake here. I'll just, I'll just wear it. And my opponent's like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, it was a big mistake. And I've got to the very end of my turn uh, before f noticing it. So we'll just leave it. So even though I could have easily got investigate signals, <laughs> I ended up, uh, I ended up forgetting about it. And I got that the next turn. As for my shooting on the right flank, I demeched the flash kits using the basilisk and the manticore to get the job done and destroying the truck and then i also took out the other truck using my exterminator and uh, i had a couple of chimeras hunter killer missiles and multi lasers and whatnot help out there as well uh, so that was two truck down and then i had some decent firepower that could make it into the battle wagon as well and i didn't quite destroy it but i heavily damaged it bringing it down to five or six wounds the reason that i went after all of the transports first is i wanted to make the orcs a lot less mobile Generally speaking, Orcs are quite a pressure army and they want to get across the board quickly and keep you busy. If you can de-mech them, if you can de-transport them, they suddenly become a lot slower. The pressure becomes much easier to handle and you can kind of blow them to pieces as they struggle across the board. So by demobilizing them, it meant that I had a big advantage 
in my own maneuverability as well as it made the orcs a lot more susceptible to my firepower. Going over to the orcs and the cracks already began to appear on their side. They drew engage on all fronts and area denial, but because they'd lost their trucks, they weren't able to get engaged very easily. And they hadn't called the war turn one because they didn't want to waste it. Most orc players don't do it until turn two because they know that's when a lot of the firepower is going to start to bear. So their mobility was really limited. They did manage to get a big unit of Gazgul and Mega Knobs into the center of the board for air denial. And I did actually have one Chimera in there. I misspoke before. I pushed one into the middle. And they destroyed the Chimera, but then the infantry piled out. And that meant that they didn't get area denial. So that was quite a good example of how the mechanized infantry can really scupper your opponent's plans. And it meant that when it came over to my turn i would actually control that jet because i had more oc there so the mech infantry doing what they do their chimera is dying but the infantry still scoring with lots of points and denying my opponent's points in this case as well going over to the orc right flank one of the beast bosses i believe it was mogrog mod rog started coming forward and the flaskets came forward as well but they couldn't all make it through the terrain so this meant that only a handful of them were shooting and so they didn't destroy a chimera and this is something i've noticed with flash kits they look really really good on paper but strength six bad ap the chimera popping smoke there's a lot of buyers that were thrown up in their way and so the flash kits failed to destroy a chimera and it was like about five of them went into the chimera and three of them went into the sentinel and they didn't destroy either one which is pretty wild Mech guard is tough. It's a lot of metal boxes. And sometimes trying to grind those metal boxes down is really inefficient. Sometimes you just need those big punchy weapons, which the orcs don't really have at range in this list. Going over to the left flank where the battle wagon was and it destroyed the sentinel, but the sentinel had essentially move blocked it from where it had positioned. So it sort of trundled forward, blew apart the sentinel and that was it. So Orc turn one, they haven't managed to make good progress forward. They're kind of wading, wading through the mire, which is exactly what I want them to do. And the worst bit is they've kind of moved out. So now I can see the battle wagon, no problems. Now I can see the flash kits, no problems. Now I can also uh, see the unit of beast boys that had come out of the, uh, the truck, no problems. So it comes over to guard turn two and... The Dakar begins. On the right flank where the flash kits are, between the two Chimeras and the infantry that were in there and the battle tank commander and the exterminator, every single flash kit is turned to red paste. I even get a unit of 10 guardsmen out and use them to move block Mosrog. So, yeah, he's just got 10 guards to chew on next turn, which I'm totally okay with because it means that I still get to hold that objective going into turn three. In the center, I use the infantry that I got out of the Chimera to move block Gaskell, just make a big daisy chain with a couple of you know, three guards on, on each end. And that scuppered his plans. Sure, he'd be able to like murder 10 guards, but I don't mind losing 20 guards to my opponent's two best remaining units. And then on the left flank, I'm able to finish off the wounded battle wagon. And then the boys and the knobs which pile out, I flatten. I flatten them with my artillery and my battle tank. Because they end up piling out uh, near to the objective. And so I'm getting a lot of re-rolls and everything. And yeah, it wasn't pretty. The 10 boys actually survived somewhat intact but the knobs were just taken out of the equation so we get to the bottom of turn two we get to the orc turn two and they've got two beast bosses and gazgul and a handful of orc boys left and there's some gretchen sat on a home objective and the guard at this point have lost one scout sentinel and are about to lose one scout sentinel and one chimera in the orc turn, they kill what they can kill. They do kill the two screening units of guardsmen, but that's about it. And the boys fail to make a charge onto the objective. 
don't quite make it. Should have mentioned that the war boss that I've been leading the knobs does survive, and he did charge into the Chimera, and he failed to kill it. And he only had like one wound left as well. Goes over to guard turn three, and I surge forward with pretty much everything, and it's not pretty. The war boss goes down, all the remaining boys go down, Mosrog goes down, and the Mega Knobs go down, but Gazgul does survive. We get to Orc turn three. Gazgul makes a charge into another unit of infantry that's screening him out. He kills them. And turn four, the Orcs are tabled. And we have to continue playing the game out because technically, when in Depticon, you don't stop the game when, every, when anyone's tabled, you play all five turns out. And so the guard have free reign to go around and score what they want. Oh, even the grots at the back are flattened by like artillery and long range uh, fire from like one of the sentinels and uh, some of the chimeras on the right flank. And the final score ends up being 90 to the guard and 35 to the orcs. So I do feel a little bit bad. It was a thorough smashing of the orcs. So victory! is assured victory for his imperial guard victory in his name it was a blistering start to the tournament and i have to say well done to kevin for putting a brave face on throughout the entire thing because it was a furious exchange of fire and unfortunately the orcs did not come out the other side very well I have to say, I think my biggest advantage in this matchup more than anything was the fact that I play against Orcs every tournament. If you go back over the tournament after actual reports, I can't think of a time when I haven't played Orcs at least once. On average, I play them every single tournament. And even if like maybe one tournament I don't play them, sometimes I'll play them twice in the next event. So I have a lot of experience going into Orcs, which means I know where the top threats are. I know what my target priority needs to be. And I kind of honed and perfected my counter orc tactics whereas on the other side kevin just hadn't played against guard before and or not in 10th edition and hadn't played against anything like mech guard so that meant that he was at a disadvantage he'd have to learn on the job where the real threats were whereas i already knew exactly where to place my shots so with one victory under my belt it was time to move on to the second round and i got paired into death guard and even more interestingly not only was I going to be playing them, but I was going to be battling them on live stream. That's right. I got the opportunity to play on the War Games live, live battle stream. I want to say a huge thank you to Joe for having me on. It was an absolute blast. By the way, if you weren't able to catch that battle live, don't worry. I'll make sure there's a link with a timestamp to it down in the description. And I'm also planning on putting a copy of the battle on this channel with a bit of extra commentary and again, a link back to War Games Live. But now let's get into the game itself. I was playing against Doug and his Death Guard. He had a very meta Death Guard list. Everything that I have come to expect when facing off against the Sons of Mortarium. There was Mortarion himself. There was also three Plague Burst Crawlers. This seems to be a bit of a staple of competitive Death Guard lists because Mortarion really buffs up their indirect fire. He also then had two units of 10 Plague Marines in Rhinos. And Plague Marines in Rhinos are so strong right now. With my own Death Guard, I'm looking at getting more Rhinos so I can have loads of Plague Marines just zipping all over the battlefield. And then he also had two units of Nurglings and two of the Chaos Knight Brigands allied in, both with their Melter and their Chain Guns. The mission that we played was Mission O from the standard GW compilation and that is vital ground with chilling rain and deployment is crucible of battle now the quirky thing about vital ground is the objective in the middle disappears so really you're just fighting over the flanks with this in mind i deployed in two armored columns at two armored fists as it were one was slightly bigger than the other so on the left flank I had three Chimeras, a Scout Sentinel, and a Tank Command, the one with Grand Strategist. And then on the right flank, I had the other three Lehman Russes and the other three Chimeras and a Sentinel. And then my artillery was in the backfield. 
The Death Guard deployed how I expected them to. Bit of a refused flank going on. There were the three Plague Burst Crawlers with Mortarion that essentially deployed on the right flank from the guard perspective, along with both of the Rhinos full of Plague Marines. And then a unit of Nurglings went into reserve and a unit of Nurglings uh, infiltrated forward onto the left hand objective. The Brigands went into reserve. So essentially a refused flank from the Nurgle player, putting all of his force trying to sweep onto the right objective and then push through onto the guard home objective. Essentially allowing the Death Guard to control three out of the four objectives if all things went to plan. But here's the thing, from the get-go I knew that was probably going to be his course of action. And so I put enough force on my right to slow that down, delay it, and hopefully counter it. And then just enough force on the left, like three Chimeras and a tank, that's enough so that you can't just ignore that. Because three Chimeras, with essentially no opposition, will happily take and hold an objective in the middle and then push forward onto the enemy home jet with lots and lots of objective control. So my plan from the beginning was to force Douglas to dilute his strength and to not let him push everything down one flank as he probably wanted to. We both picked tactical objectives and then there was only one thing left to do, find out who's gonna go first. And normality resumed and returned because the Death Guard went first. However, before they started doing all of their movement, I had my scout moves. And on the left-hand side, my three Chimera scout moved forward aggressively because there's only a bunch of Nurglings threatening them. And on the right side, I scout moved defensively so that the Plague Burst Claws wouldn't get some easy line of sight onto them. As for the Death Guard, their turn one was pretty lackluster. They moved forward an armored spearhead down the right flank, but they didn't bring the Rhinos out to play. I'm not sure if this was a mistake. It did mean that the Death Guard armor did start getting fed into the guard piecemeal, but also at the same time, if he had pulled those Rhinos out from behind cover, they would have been the first thing that I went for. I was fairly confident that I could outlast him in an armor duel, but those Plague Marines I knew were going to be the main threat. With nothing for the Plague Burst Crawlers to shoot directly, they then went over to their Plague Burst Mortars, and they did not do well. Each one rolled six shots, but between my Sentinels saving and... Doug's rolling, I didn't even lose a Scout Sentinel turn one. I think one got reduced down to three wounds and another one got a little bit damaged, but that was really it. So the opening volley from the Death Guard really wasn't much to worry about. And this is something I have to say that I've noticed of Playboy's Claws. Everyone goes, oh, they're indirect, it's amazing. All right. Trent, they, what, AP one, damage two? Maybe my perception has just been skewed because of guard artillery, but that really doesn't seem like much to write home about on the indirect fire front. We then go over to the guard first turn, and I was able to push forward on the left flank, and between the scout moving and regular moving and other line of sight, I was happily able to target the Nurglings and destroy them, which was good. Uh, that got me no prisoners, I believe, for one of my secondaries. And then on the right, I just launched a bunch of uh, artillery into one of the Plague Burst Crawlers and was able to halve its health. But honestly, that was it. I was playing it very cagey. I was just getting myself into a position. So next turn, when the Plague Train came forward a bit further, because it was gonna have to if it wanted to take that objective that it kind of committed to, then I would be able to step out and do the damage. Plague Burst Crawler Train drives forward and this time it destroys one of the Sentinels and it also is able to uh, get a bit of scattered shots on other targets as well, but no meaningful damage done there. So the Sentinel does die, but I use 2CP to bring it back with reinforcements. On the left flank though, in a surprise move, the two Brigands come in up there. I think that this was done in response to the armoured fist push from those three Chimeras. I understand that if Doug hadn't done that, his home objective was wide open. But in a funny sort of way, that really helped me. 
Because I had so many chimeras up there and so much objective control that those two brigands, all they were doing was stopping him from losing his objective, but they weren't going to help him score any extra points. And it meant that he now didn't have all of his armor pushing down onto the right. And so even though he's an elite army, he's begun to spread out and his force concentration is starting to become diluted. And unfortunately for Doug as well, his brigands do a good amount of damage, but they fail to kill the Chimera that they go after. And so we end up with a Sentinel that is very badly damaged and a Chimera that is very badly damaged, but no outright units destroyed from those two baby knights uh chimeras being 11 wounds with that three up save t9 it's just it's a it's a lot harder to deal with than people think it is i think a couple of melt shots will pop one and it, it's not quite like that so at the end of death guard turn two they've committed all of their resources they've lost a unit of nurglings oh the other one is deep struck down to get teleport homers in my deployment zone and they've spread their forces out and all they've really killed is a scout center which is going to come back then it comes over to guard turn two shooting and i leap forward i spring the counter attack the big push on the left i get a unit of infantry out and i move block the two knights no problem whatsoever I stay still with a lot of my firepower up there so that I'm able to get my lethal hits off. And I'm also uh, able to daring recon one of the knights as well, which is good for my uh, artillery. I use my tank commander that's sort of on the back left to clear and pick up the Nurglings and he's able to do that no problem. So that's both use of Nurglings taken care of now. My opponent's ability to do backfield secondaries has been neutered. And then we go over to the right flank. Demarcia tank moves forward, exterminate tank moves forward. My battle tank is actually able to stay still. And the Sentinel comes back over there. Chimera moves forward. I'm able to move forward and jump unit of infantry out, which uh, helps me get some points. Uh, I do get overwatched by a couple of plague spurters or spewers, but fortunately just enough guardsmen survive. So I'm able to retain control of that objective. And then the firepower unleashes. And the Sentinel and the Chimeras and the Exterminator and the Battle Tank all go into one of the Plague Burst Crawlers and are able to take it down. It's actually the injured Plague Burst Crawler. It took a lot of firepower, but we were able to grind it down and bring it down. And that was all I was really expecting. And then the Demolisher Commander goes. He rolls seven shots. The blessed number. Lucky for some. But apparently, Papa Nurgle wasn't blessed in the Death Guard today. Because my tank commander with his Demolish Cannon gets all his hits, all his wounds, and then three of those wounds go through, and I roll a four, a five, and a six on the Plague Burst Crawler, which essentially blows it up in one go. Woohoo, <laughs> baby! And losing two Playboys Crawlers there completely neuters that armored push. I now have the firepower advantage beyond a shadow of a doubt, even with Mortarion flapping around. I'm just stoically refusing to engage Mortarion, as is my way. If I see a Demon Primarch, I kill everything around them. I'm not interested in fighting them until they're the last thing, and then I bring them down. But things go from bad to worse, because on the left flank, between all of the artillery and all my other various firepower, heavy heavy boulders, hunter killers, 50 cows, last guns, flamers, you name it, we got it. Electronic ball breakers. Slams into one of the brigands and brings that down as well. So now it's a lone brigand taking on three armored fist squads and a tank commander. And it's one Plague Burst Crawler facing down three Lehman Russes. Sure, there's the Plague Marines in the Rhinos, but they are going to be another turn before they get involved. And so that was a big, big hit. That turn two was a big, big swing. And I would say that put the game firmly into the guard's corner. But it wasn't over because those Plague Marines are the best thing in the Death Guard Army right now. And they were about to get involved. Now, despite the fact that Death Guard just got hit hard, over the next two turns, 
Successive waves of Plague Marines really prove their worth. Infantry squads, Chimeras, Sentinels, even Lehman Russes can barely hold them back. And essentially, I destroy one wave, wave of Plague Marines as it's back to the side of my defenses, only for the next wave to come in and smash through my next line. And by the time we get to the bottom of turn four, yeah, all the Plague Marines are dead, but there's nothing left on the guard right flank that can meaningfully move on to that middle objective. And they've kind of got it locked down, which is crazy, but they did it. 20 Plague Marines did more than three Plague Burst Crawlers ever could have done. And they also managed to buy time for Matarian to come in and he started threatening the guard backfield objective as well. He bats his way through a chimera or two to get there. And the guard is actually forced to start scrabbling around on the backfield objective, making sure that we don't lose so we can continue getting lots of primary and stopping the death guard from getting lots towards the end of the game. So the right flank essentially becomes a stalemate despite the, the, the very strong start that the guard had over there. On the left flank, it takes two turns, turn three and turn four, to actually bring down that second brigand. That was hugely in part the fact that, you know, the Chimera started dying. And also, I'd spaffed off all my hunter killers into the first brigand. And so it took a lot of heavy bolt arounds and heavy stubbers and chip damage to bring down the second one. But we get to the end of turn four and we run out of time. And this being Adepticon, we're really not allowed to talk out. They have a very strict no talking out, no colluding uh, policy. And considering that we're on live stream, my opponent says, oh, do you want to talk out the last turn? I say, I'd love to, but we're not allowed. And considering that we're on stream, I think it's best that we stick rigidly to the rules pack. And my opponent goes, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. So what we do is we work out the score where it was at that point. And it was, I believe, about sort of 30, 40 points to the Death Guard and then about 50 to the Imperial Guard. So we managed to get a good win out of that game. And then for our own curiosity, we then saw what would happen going into turn five. And the Guard, again, was able to maintain their lead and was able to uh, win the game by about 10 points, about 60 points to 50 for the Death Guard. I have to say, overall, I really enjoyed this game. It was a ton of fun, very thematic. A guard tank company engaged in an armored clash versus a host of Nurgle demon engines. Both sides were very vehicle heavy, both sides were very mechanized. And in the end, the Emperor's true finest were able to prevail. But those Plague Marines really scared the crap out of me and they did so much work. And for my own Death Guard army, I'm starting to look into how I can get as many mechanized plague marines in there as possible because they were so powerful so with two wins to my name i was pretty confident going into round three and i got paired into mike with his custodies this was a really interesting game because actually the first chance that i got to play custodies in 10th edition they've just not been a big part of my local meta recently i've seen them across the tables but i've never had a chance to fight against them and Mike had a really good list. And what I came to realize afterwards was pretty much the quintessential competitive meta list of the Adeptus Custodes, the Banana Boys. His army consisted of two of the large Caladius tanks with the Blaze Cannons. And then he had six bricks of Custody infantry. Three of them were the Wardens and three of them were the Custodian Guard. There were various characters sprinkled throughout as well. Blade Champions were there, Trajan was there, and he also had the Inquisitor Carrier Draxus, who was in one of the Custodian Guard squads, and that allowed her to get some sort of double shoot shenanigans. It was really, really cool. There was also a Calidus Assassin and two units of the Sisters of Silence. The mission that we were playing was Mission H, and that is the Ritual, Chilling Rain, and Hammer and Anvil deployment. Now, I have to say, this was a really difficult setup for me. Firstly, with it being the Ritual, there's only the one objective in the middle. And what I want to do when facing Custodes is to try and force them to spread out onto the flanks where it's much more open, where I can bring my guns to bear. In the middle of the board, that's a lot harder to do because they're able to hold the objective from behind some line of sight blocking terrain fairly easily. 
Also, with it being hammer and anvil deployment, the flanks were much more narrow. So spreading out and being able to maintain force concentration is eminently doable. On top of this, I just very rarely play the ritual. I think it has come up out of the dozens of 10th edition tournaments that I've played, maybe in two games, and that was in a local RTT format, not in a big super major against a big strong list like this one. So I definitely had the knowledge disadvantage in this game for sure. And then to top it all off and make it a really unfamiliar game for me, I went for tactical objectives and the custodians went for fixed. And at the time, I didn't appreciate how good fixed objectives were for the Golden Horde. The fixed objectives that they went for were bring it down, which makes sense. I am running a lot of tanks and also deploy teleporter Homer. We then get to deployment and a thousand points of the custodians went straight into reserve and that was the majority of their infantry and the starting on the board they had the two tanks the two units of sisters of silence and i think it was one unit no two units to say of the infantry one wardens and one of the custodian guard with carrier draxus we also had the Caladus assassin who started on the board as well and then we rolled off to see who would get first turn. And it happened again. I went first. Tell you what, man. I think I need to start saying that I go first in more games than I go second. Because it seems that my tradition of going second has been truly smashed and broken. Because I've gone first in a lot of battles now. Now, turn one, I draw extend battle lines and engage north fronts. So these are two objectives that I can do quite easily. I've deployed in a fairly standard format because I wasn't sure what to expect. So I had... Basilisks and Manticores at the back, a couple of tanks on one flank, a couple of tanks with the flank Chimera spread out kind of evenly. And so for extend battle lines and engagement fronts, I basically yeet forward uh, a couple of Chimeras to push back the Custodes and to start getting me lots of points. Extend battle lines is fairly simple. I marched into the middle with uh, an armored fist squad and was able to uh, extend my battle lines as well as poop out an extra objective doing the ritual. The custodies were almost entirely hidden out of line of sight, although there was one unit of wardens I was able to drop my artillery onto. And between uh, the firepower from the basilisk and from the manticore, I wasn't able to kill any, but it was a significant enough threat that my opponent did pop his once per game four plus feel no pain. And that four plus feel no pain really did uh, save those, those wardens from taking any damage. Turn 1 Custodes is pretty tame. They bring one of the tanks out and it's able to get line of sight onto the Chimera and destroy it, which gives them three points to bring it down. And then they march forward one of the Custodian Warden units and they also shuffle forward with the Custodian Guard unit. Now, the Custodian Guard is hiding behind the line of sight blocking terrain very near the objective, but not quite on the objective. And then you've got the Kalidus Assassin, who at the end of my turn pops up and goes down within six inches of the middle of the board. And so she's able to just deploy teleport to Homer, but she's low in operative, so I can't get near her. And if I try and get near her, there's a unit of Custodian Guard ready to pounce on me and just do terrible, terrible things to me. So it's a really, really di difficult dilemma. To, uh, and I really like this thing that the custodians do because it means that they don't have to come out and expose one of their own units and they kind of force you to come to them. So if I go anywhere near that center to try and counter that deployed teleporter Homer, I am going to get flattened by a full unit of custodian guard. Whatever I put there is going to die because they've got so many attacks each. But even if I did have the ability to go into the middle of the board and Barney with them, I'm not going to have the chance to do it. Because the Wardens with the Blade Champion, I think, have move and advance and charge. And so they come barreling down the flank at me and they're right in my face, putting me under immense pressure. So I would love to go after the middle, but I can't. I know I can only really delete with my firepower one unit of these guys because they're really, really tough. And so I've got my unit that I've got to deal with uh, in my turn two. 
Going over to the guard turn two, I do draw some fairly stinky objectives. I get uh, area denial and attempting target. I can't really get area denial because of the custodian guard that are making my life a bit of a misery and the cardus, which is just within six. And then I've also got uh, tempting target, which they just pick for their own objective, which they pooped out as part of the ritual. I, might, I have to use my once per game bin an objective off at the beginning and redraw it. And I do get defend stronghold. So at least I've got three victory points coming in. I'm holding two prime objectives, so I do get uh, 10 points for that. And then it goes over to my shooting. And basically, I destroy that one unit of wardens because they don't have their four, feel no pain now. And it, but even so, it took pretty much all of my firepower to get rid of them, which was a worrying sign. But the real hot tamale of my turn one, and the thing that completely took me by surprise, and this is just a great example of how playing against an army or not playing against an army can make such a big difference. My opponent rapid ingressed Trajan and a unit of wardens. Oh, so I do all of my movement and I set myself up so I can delete that unit of custodian wardens on the left. And after I finish my movement, another unit drops in on the right flank. And now I'm out of position and I can't deal with them. I haven't got the firepower to deal with them at all. Oh, just a nightmare. So I kill one unit of wardens, but then going over to this custodian's turn two, I'm right under pressure again. Because the next unit of warden comes in, but now it's on the other flank and I don't have much to deal with them. i got like one battle tank and one chimera and one sentinel over there. And that's not going to stop Trajan and that's not going to stop the wardens. And it's not going to stop both of them combined. No way, Jose. And we get to Custodes turn two and Trajan and the boys start smashing my right flank to pieces. They get both the sentinel and the chimera, which is over there. And then on the left flank... They deep strike down a unit of custodian guard. And so I'm under pressure again to try and deal with these things. And from, I think they get a reroll to charge and they're able to get a long bomb charge on the left flank and they start tying up some of my screening units that I've got over there as well. And then the custodies that were with the Calidus realize that they've got an opportunity here and they start pushing forward into the middle. So I'm on all fronts, the custodians are holding objectives and they're giving me too many threats to deal with. I can only deal with one squad at a time. And now I've got three coming at me. <sighs> really, really tough. The Cardus continues to get deployed teleporter home in the center. And between uh, Trajan and the lads, they're able to get five points on Bring It Down. But it ain't over until it's over. And we all know that the guard get hit hard but we hit back even harder. I still managed to control two prime at the beginning of my turn. Give me another 10 primary points. For my secondaries, I actually draw some really good ones. I get deployed teleport home and behind enemy lines. And guess what? It's turn three and the Cyclops demolition vehicle is ready to rock and roll. He comes in on the back field of the enemy deployment zone and is able to deploy teleport home and get me five points and gets me behind the line for three points. So that... Little dude right there gets me eight points, and I still get 18 victory points in my turn three. As for the firepower, I am able to delete one of the custodian warden units that came in from uh, Deep Strike. Even with their feel no pain, I am able to just put Demolisher and I put um, my Exterminator in there, and I've got another tank commander. I've just got everything, just all the artillery just goes in, goes in, goes in, and I managed to completely overwhelm them. Apologies, it wasn't the Wardens, it was a unit of regular Custodian Guard, so they didn't have the feel no pain. So I was able to flatten one unit of Custodian Guard and their attending characters, and I'm able to screen out Trajan and the boys for a turn to stop them from piling in and start getting into the back lines and getting into where my artillery is. So I've screened out one unit, I've deleted another, there's just that third unit in the middle which I haven't really been able to do anything to. Custodies turn three, they start pressing home their advantage. I've had to go balls to the wall to try and push them back, and this has left me somewhat exposed. As a result, I do end up giving up nine bring it down points this turn, and they continue using the calendars to get the deployed teleporter homer, 
and then also they're pooping out more and more rituals so they are able to uh, get maximum on their primary shots because those are just steamrolling the points they're just going for it and they're putting me under a pressure but for every unit that they're throwing for every two units they're throwing forward i am able to delete one of them so i'm being pushed back it's a bit of a fight to retreat but i am dealing damage to them and i'm still managing to rack up the points and the luck of the Emperor is with me because going into turn four, I still control two prime by the skin of my teeth. I'm holding two prime. That gets me 10 primary points. I also then draw capture enemy outpost and secure no man's land. Capture enemy outpost. I take my Cyclops demolition vehicle and I move and advance him onto the enemy uh, back objective which is being held by four Sister Silence, and I then Basilisk those Sister Silence back to the grave. And my little Cyclops gets me Captain Enemy Outpost. So, so far, I think he's got me like 19 points or something insane. He's just going for it. He's going for it. And then I also get secure No Man's Land because I need to be able to control two objectives. And I'm like, you know what? Screw it. We're going in, and I just throw as much of my army forward as I can to try and secure my remaining cameras, my remaining infantry to secure No Man's Land. So even though I am getting heavily pressured by the custodies, this turn I still get 23 victory points. I might be going down, but I ain't going down easy. Unfortunately for myself, the custodies pain train continues to work forward methodically. And if you look, they're just sitting on their three prime that they've managed to poop out. One in the middle, two that they created with the ritual. So that's another 15 points to them. Bring it down. They're able to get one of the chimeras that I push forward with. That's another four points. And now they use the Calidus. Now that gaps are opening up in my deployment zone because of my fighting retreat. They use the Calidus to jump up and down and they get deployed teleport over in my deployment zone now. They did that obviously the up and down at the end of my turn and down at the beginning of their turn. The custodians are just pushing in, but they are actually losing steam. Uh, Trajan's blob isn't looking so healthy. And I think at this point, I have wiped out three and a half of the six custodies uh, bricks. And I've got one of the tanks down to half health. And I've wiped out both units of Sisters Silence. And I'm holding the enemy home objective. So they're not just walking across the field. But they are, keep, they are keeping me away from the middle. And this is allowing them to just gain, a, just run away with the points. It gets to round five. And it doesn't look good for the guard. I'm only on my home objective for primary. Or am I? Because the Cyclops demolition vehicle still lives. And he's on the enemy home objective. So that little Cyclops gets me another five victory points. What an absolute giga chad. And then I draw overwhelming force and cleanse. And I almost get max overwhelming force. I wipe out all of the custodian guard in another blob. And there's just the blade champion left. And I get him down to like one wound. But I can't quite finish him off. If I'd got him as well, that would have been two units for overwhelming force. As it is, I still get three points. And I draw cleanse. And I am able to throw... I'm throwing like tanks onto middle objectives and all sorts of crazy things now. But it doesn't matter. I can lose 95% of my army and still... You know, get points. And so I get maximum cleanse. I get three for overwhelming force. And I get 10 on primary. So I get another 18 points. So I've been having big point scoring turns every single turn. But despite my best efforts, custodians at this point have maxed out, bring it down. The Calidus is still in my deployment zone. Lone Optive making it very difficult for me to target her. She deploys Teleport to Homer, and the Custodians are all over the middle primary, and so they get another 15 points for their primary. And the Custodians don't even do anything, and they don't kill anything in their turn, because we're low on time. Uh, uh, Mike literally just goes, I'm going to deploy Teleport to Homer and score my primary, and that's it. And so we get to the end of the battle, and both sides are absolutely battered. I think pretty much all of the Custodians' infantry at this point, bar one or two... Uh, blobs here and there that have taken some casualties are pretty badly knackered and the tanks are damaged there's no such time both sides are hammered i'm probably down to just my battle tanks and my artillery and mike is down to a handful of infantry in his tanks and the final score 
is 90 points to the Imperial Guard. A phenomenal result, if I do say so myself. Like, that's a game-winning score there. But unfortunately, it's not. Because the Custodes get 97 points. An eye-wateringly good result. And a very, very well played and very well done to Mike. Because I feel like he played that game perfectly he had me on the ropes in the beginning he had me on pressure from the beginning and he just kept his eyes on the prize and he just kept racking up those points this game was one of the most interesting for me out of the tournament and that was because it was new i'd not played custodians before and i've been hearing about their pure infantry shenanigans but i hadn't really appreciated how powerful they were until i faced off against them but you know what I'm totally okay with this. I'm totally okay with them marching into the middle of the board and charging you down and scoring points really well because it feels like Custodes are actually playing for the first time in a long time how they should. We're not having swarms of bikes zipping all over the place, we're not seeing fleets of dreadnoughts, armadas of tanks. What is winning the Custodes games is infantry. It's the bodyguard. It's the actual Custodes themselves. And there's nothing more badass than a phalanx of golden heroes, all with halberds and swords and shields, just marching across the board and delivering the Emperor's justice. And it works. The only criticism I would have is it does feel very reminiscent of 9th edition, where the custodians kind of wander into the game and they're like, well, I'm going to get 90 plus points. And it's kind of up to you to try really, really hard to stop me from doing that. So there is a whiff of ninth edition about it. It's a little uninteractive, but it is such a minor criticism. And at the end of the day, it's a totally valid tactic and it does work. And even though I played a lot of ninth edition and I kind of got burned out by ninth edition, from a 10th edition perspective, it's a very novel approach. because Most people aren't taking fix. Most people are taking tactical. So custodians are in a quite unique, unique position where fixed objectives are doing them a lot of good. Now, if this was a regular RTT, then that would be the third and final round. And I would have managed to go two and one and I would have been very happy with that. But this is not a regular RTT. This is a Decepticon champs. And so there was one more round. Game number four. That wouldn't be finishing until well past 10 p.m. Now, I have to say that a lot of people did sack off round four. <laughs> the hall definitely emptied somewhat, but that meant that just the hardcore, the battle hardened people were left to fight. Actually, what was it very interesting is most of the competitive players that had lost a game, but a lot of the try-hard people didn't stay for round four. And the majority of people that were still playing at that time were either the really, really hardcore who had done really, really well and were playing all of their games to see who was going to get into the top 16 for the next day, which wouldn't include me because I've already lost a game. And everyone else that was left over was actually the people that had exactly the right mindset. Round four, despite the fact that I was absolutely knackered, was possibly my favorite round because everyone around me that was playing had just the perfect mindset. All of my opponents were great this tournament. Don't get the wrong impression. But round four, everyone was there just having banter, going, hey, it's round four, screw it, let's just make crazy things happen. For example, there was a guard player on my left who, when facing off against World Eaters, literally said fuck it it's round four and put his entire army on the line he was like if i go first i'm coming at you and if you go first i've lost fortunately the world eaters did go first against him but he that was the attitude of the people everyone was very laissez-faire people were just having a good time getting that last game in and just throwing down and my battle brother for round four was alex and his gene stealer cult now, GSC are not a faction that I play against very often at all. In fact, I'm not sure I have played against them in 10th edition. Maybe I did once very early on, but I still have good knowledge of these guys 
because it's a faction that I actually do play. And so whilst I haven't battled against them, by playing with them myself, I have had some good insights. This meant that unlike in round three, I actually had an inkling of what my opponent's good and bad units were and where my target priority needed to be and what to expect from the faction as a whole. As for his list, Alex had a bit of a smorgasbord, but all of the faction favorites were there. There was a big unit of aberrants, 10 of them, led by a biophagus. There was a big unit of 10 Gene Stealers that were led by a Patriarch, uh, two five-man units of Gene Stealers, and then there were, th I think, two or three units of the Acolytes with Demolition Charges, and there were two or three units of the Neophytes with things like Mining Lasers and Seismic Cannons, and then there were lots of cool characters. So there, there were two of the Saboteurs who he put out in no man's land and they're lone operative and so the moment you but if you go within 12 inches of them they do like d3 plus three mortal wounds so that's really cool so they're kind of cheap and disposable and you can't target them but the moment you get closer to target them they blow you up i really really liked how sort of sneaky they were uh, and there's also like a nexus and a clamorous in there as well doing nexus and clamorous things the mission for round four was mission A, take and hold, chilling rain, and search and destroy. For my deployment, I went hyper aggressive, all on the line. It is my experience that gene stealers tend to struggle with cracking open a transport and killing the stuff on the inside. And so my thinking was that I'm gonna push forward onto all of these objectives, with all of these metal boxes, and a lot of the objectives are kind of out in the open. So when he comes and hits me back, he's going to be exposed and I'm going to be able to start scything him down. Also, if I get the first turn, because uh, he's gone kind of aggressive with some of his deployment as well, I'll be able to scout move forward and then move forward and just start burning and purging from the get go. For the Gene Stealer deployment, the main thing was that the Aberrants infiltrated over onto my left flank and then they had loads of gene stealers that were basically on the line ready to go and they had a ridge runner with a mortar that was just at the back guarding the home objective and then pretty much everything else went in reserve lots of acolytes neophytes just ready to pop out of the ground and start cult ambushing me so with all of our forces down and our tactical objectives ready to go there was just one last thing to do to find out who was going to go first who was going to go first the final time in our championship journey i don't mean to alarm anyone i went first again that's three out of four times going first who is this person who is a skinwalker where is morning morning doesn't go first well apparently morning does go first quite a lot these days going first this game was big because the gene stealer cult want to ambush me all over the place and the more that i can scout move and go forward and everything the more that i can push them back and start corralling them and boxing them in. And the quicker that I can get onto those objectives and start locking them down. So my turn one was very aggressive. Chimera on the left objective, two Chimeras onto the middle objective and two Chimeras onto the bottom right objective. I had tanks that could cover my, three of my four tanks, my exterminator, a regular tank commander with a battle cannon and my uh, battle, a Lemus battle tank were covering the middle objective and the right objective. And then I had the demolisher, a sentinel and a scout, sen a scout sentinel and a chimera moving up and going after the aberrants who were on my left flank. Now, by being this aggressive, two things happened. Firstly, the reductor saboteurs went off and between them did about 10 mortal wounds, which was quite impressive. Uh, they were able to just damage one of the chimeras that was going up towards the left and damage one of the chimeras that was going down towards the right. But by being this aggressive, I was able to take advantage of the surprisingly good fire lanes on this map. And so I had a lot of chimeras who were able to start flaming stuff and a lot of tanks that were able to start drawing line of sight. And by the time the dust had settled, not only had I killed both of the saboteurs, but I'd also been able to delete one of the five-man units of pure strains and also destroy the uh, nearly nearly wipe out 
the big 10 man unit of pure strains as well. I'd also started doing work on the aberrants. Now these guys are really, really tough, but between the Demolisher tank and the Sentinel and the Chimera and some supporting artillery fire, was able to kill three of them. Now every single one of these aberrants that I can bring down makes them eminently less threatening because they're not actually that strong. They're only like sort of strength eight, I think. So they're wounding a lot of on fives. They do have some like lethal hits and stuff, but still, every single one that I can kill reduces their volume. And you can be as tanky as you like, but if you're not doing any damage output, you are eventually going to get destroyed. So I'm thinking my plan here was just to grind the aberrants down over two or three turns and essentially make it so they had negligible damage output. For my objectives this turn, I did have Bring It Down and Cleanse, which I was able to do fairly easily. Bring It Down was the Ridge Runner. I just put the Manticore in it and flattened it, and then it was the Bad that went after the Aberrants because I wanted to slow them down anyway. But what was significant is, despite the fact that I wiped out a couple of small units of the Gene Stealer Cult, their character didn't come back, but some of the other ones did. I think I wiped out both five man units of pure strains and damaged the 10 man unit. And he got the four plus on both of those five man pure strain units. So despite the fact that I'd done loads of damage and taken lots of board control, all I'd really done is killed a couple of Reductor Saboteurs and a Ridge Runner. And everything else was coming back. Turn two for the GSC is a little mild. A lot of their early units that were gonna rush me and start tying me up have kind of been neutralized and the ones that are coming back from court ambush have had to come back quite far back because of the threat the chimeras have of basically just driving over there and just deleting the, the ambush tokens so what really happens is on the left flank the aberrants come in and they beat the crap out of the sentinel and are also able to uh, do a lot of wounds to the chimera but i don't think they quite destroy it in the middle the Patriarch and the remaining uh, Gene Stealers come in and they're able to do a lot of damage to one of the Chimeras, but they don't quite destroy it. Good, because it means I've still got essentially an intact uh, Armoured Fist Squad over there. And then we get over to the right flank where like some scrap units start coming at me, but there's not really a big threat over there. So they're sort of sneaking from a, from ruins to ruins, but there's no threat on the on the right flank. Turn one. That's around two kicks off, and the guard are sitting pretty on three prime objectives, getting me a big 15 points. I also have air now and engage all fronts. Engage all fronts I've already got because I'm in three quarters, and I'm happy to just stay in those three quarters, so I get three points for that. And air now, all I need to do is kill a patriarch and two gene stealers, and there are. Well, there's a Chimera that, that admittedly has been tied up in combat that just falls back. And behind it is a Chimera and there's also a tank. So needless to say, the Patriarch and his two bug buddies get burned and blasted back to the abyss from whence they came. And that secures me air denial. So I get a lot of points turn to 23 victory points in one round. That's spicy. And it gives me a huge leg up. Especially when you take into account the fact that going into Gene Stealer Cult turn two, they had no primary and the objective that they got was secure no man's land. They also drew air denial, but I've got a Chimera with a full squad of infantry sat on there. So that's not going to happen anytime soon. I know I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Um, should mention that on the aberrant flank, uh, I'm able to kill a, a couple more of them. That's it. So I've, I've whittled them down to about five and the Barophages at this point. Uh, the Demolisher was struggling a little bit because they kept spending the stratagem that gives them minus one to hit. It's either low op or minus one to hit if you're over, uh, if you're within the low op range. But going back to the Gene Stealer Cult turn, uh, this is when the Acolytes came in. And the Acolytes dropped in with their demo charges and they do some serious damage. They're able to actually destroy uh, one of the Chimeras on the right flank and heavily damage the other one as well. But I still control that objective. Because he destroys a Chimera with his Acolytes and then my guys spill out onto the objective and I'm able to hold it. 
because he's had to deploy like three inches away but i put my cameras in such a way so that it's difficult for him to actually get onto the objective even with some like conga lining and so he does manage to essentially uh in his turn two the aberrants destroy the chimera the infantry get out and the acolytes drop down and are able to destroy a chimera and the infantry gets out but now he's kind of exposed the aberrants are really out in the open at this point and the acolytes are out there as well and they ain't that tough they're only t4 one wound and then we get to guard turn three shooting and i bring all of my guns to bear on the left flank i hit the aberrants with demarcia cannons flamers i level both artillery pieces into them and because they've been sort of moving forward and getting quite aggressive and charging they've actually exposed themselves to direct fire from the basilisks and from the manticore because they're on the terrain and the barophages is actually like on the terrain as well so we can't even like remove the first one to make the second one not hit as good remove the first model to make the second artillery piece hit not as good i should say and the aberrants get flattened because i put take aim on both of them and um there so i'm hitting on twos lethal hits because i'm heavy plus take aim plus i'm firing directly and so the aberrants just get completely flattened. The Biophages survives, but the aberrants are gone. And that flank is secure. And he rolls his dice, and the aberrants don't come back. It's round three now. So there's, they're not getting the plus one to hit. Plus one to come back from caught ambush. On the right flank, the acolytes get completely toasted by like my infantry squad that powered out the chimera the other chimera with double flamers in it and because they're on an objective naturally i'm going to hit them with the lemurus battle tank first four re-rolls i'm getting blast acolytes go down and they don't come back up until this point everything that i killed like came back but the turn three onwards that was when the franchise turned around and the gsc didn't get any units back They've brought in a bunch of like neophytes and other stuff that they were trying to use to get area denial and those get picked up as well. And so turn three is brutal. By the end of turn three, the GSC have essentially got a couple of five man pure strain units back. And they've got a unit of acolytes still in reserve and they've got a bunch of neophytes. And that's about it. But the call are not out. They still have another unit of Acolytes in reserve and the second wave of Pure Strains, the ones that respawned, are coming at me. And their Neophytes with mining lays and stuff are going to make an appearance. Turn 3, they do hit back hard. I essentially lose my remaining Chimeras that were in the middle and the right flank. And a lot of my infantry also gets uh, badly punished as well. I am essentially de by the end of turn 3, but my firepower my tanks my artillery and a, and a lot of the flamers my infantry are really good in this game because i've got flamers is essentially left intact and so despite a really valiant effort from the gene stealer cult turn four comes around and they are tabled near as damn it the remaining pure strains go down they don't come back. The acolytes that had dropped down uh, again on the right flank and had got rid of the final chimera and, and, and done some other damage is also destroyed. They're also destroyed. The neophytes that had bravely tried to charge down the middle objective are hosed down by, I think I've got one chimera left and uh, the infantry squad from the first chimera. And so it's just brutal. It's absolutely brutal. I'm able to basically wipe them down to just a few scraplet units. And admittedly, I have got a quite a few scraps myself. But turn four, really, there's not much left for the TSC to go on. In their turn, they're able to pick up a little bit of primary. And uh, they're able to destroy... I uh, had like a three-man infantry squad on objective, which did get them one no prisoners and, and three points for overwhelming force. But that is... That is all they wrote. Going into round five, the guard are able to max all of their points on primary 
and on secondaries and there's nothing left for them to really shoot. The Gene Steelers are tabled and the final score ends up being 100, a neat 100 points to the Emperor's True Finest and the GSC forced to retreat with 47 victory points to their name. And so, with the final Laz Bolt shot, the final Battle Cannon shells thrown across the battlefield, the dust settles. And the Guard have managed to come away with three victories and one close defeat. My main takeaways from this tournament is that Met Guard was really, really strong. The ability to be so fast, something that guard normally can't do, just scout move plus regular move on Chimeras is fantastic. And combining that with some pretty strong firepower and the Chimeras being able to operate independently, just having a few flamers, meant that I was able to, in a lot of games, be very aggressive, push forward and take, and more importantly, hold territory. One of the big things that allowed me to score points against the Custodians was that they would consider like kill a chimera and the guys would get out but still manage to like hold that objective that you know that kept me going that got me so many points despite the fact they were kind of all over me like a bad rash one thing that i would say is that um i think Matt guy is very very good at countering assault armies the fact that the orcs and the custodies and even though i did lose that custodies game i think that was more of a knowledge thing than anything else i'll, I'll get them next time um the fact that i was able to play against the orcs and the gsc and the custodies and essentially not worry about the assault armies because i knew that they were going to come in kill the cameras i don't care about that and i'd still be able to then pound them into dust with my tanks was really really good if there was any improvements that i would make to this list i would probably go it's tough to say because I did actually really like having all the heavy bolters and stuff on the Chimeras. But one thing I'd love to try out is going double heavy flame on the Chimeras. See if that makes a difference. It potentially unlocks a lot of overwatch shenanigans as well. Because I can't overwatch with the flamers inside because that's firing deck. Also, I would say that you could improve this list by getting rid of a lot of the tanks and instead focusing on artillery. In that third game, if I had had loads of artillery rather than battle tanks, if I had more indirect fire rather than direct firepower, those stories that were trying to hide behind the wall could have been healthily flattened. And that would have meant I could move in onto the Kalidus who was taking that objective and deploying teleport time on it, and swept that aside, and that would have really scuppered the custodies plans. So yes, artillery is very, very strong, and this list did okay without it, but it would be remiss of me to deny that it would have it would have been improved without it artillery definitely would have helped in a couple of games but despite all that i was able to win three of my games and i could hold my head up high with that loss because i did score quite highly and the end result is i placed 27th out of about 260 270 players which i will certainly take i think that's the best i've ever done in a super major event by far and it was a blast. Met guard, definitely viable, definitely competitive, and being able to play on GW terrain was fantastic. Definitely a change over WTC and UKTC. And I was told, although I have to admit I haven't independently verified this, that by coming 27th with the guard, I was the highest placed guard player at Adepticon, which is kind of cool. I'll take best in faction. But that just about wraps everything up. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. If you did, please let me know what you thought down in the comment section below. Is there anything that you would change about the Met Guard Army that I was running? And do you have any comments about Adepticon? Were you there? How did your games go? And what did you feel about the event overall? If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to smash that like button and also subscribe to never miss an episode. Would you like to know more? If so, then please consider becoming a channel member or patron. By supporting the channel, not only will you be doing your part, but you'll also be helping me create more content 
for your viewing pleasure and unlocking a whole host of perks. You get everything from a badge next to your name, custom emojis, but the big one is access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with almost two and a half thousand active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got channels for army lists, hobbying, tactics, stories, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. For all you greenhorns that wanted to see the Mordian glory hole, today is a lucky day. And joking aside, I do want to say a massive thank you to all of the current channel members and patreons you guys are amazing truly the lifeblood of the channel i could not do more during glory full-time without the incredible and generous support of my members so thank you guys so much and last but certainly not least i want to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier patreons these are the war masters, the people who have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty. To a heartfelt thank you to Alex Dengal, Bon Bon Vert, Mad Larkin, Marcus Roberts, Mark Panconi, RJ Scorpion, Swordfish Trombone, Try Again Bragg, John Stubbs, Nick Wolf, Diesel Fox, and August Barney. Seriously guys, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Your support is incredible and it makes a huge difference. Thank you so much. That's all for now. Hope you've all enjoyed today's video. And of course, as always, see you guys next time.